group together. So um, it's just a blessing to be a part of it and um, to have you all along for the journey. So we're going to start off with a word of prayer, and you all can go ahead and stand, and we'll worship together. Father God, Lord, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the blessings that you pour out on us, Lord, for the uh, for the chance to celebrate those blessings like you, like you gave us last night, Lord. Father, we just... Uh, each and every day that we that you <laughs> that you wake us up and get us out of bed, Lord, is another uh, opportunity just to praise you and 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 live for you, Lord. So, Father, as we as we lift up these songs, I just ask that um, that it would be a sweet sacrifice to you, Lord. That it would be like that that incense, that pleasing aroma. And Father, uh, we lift up the service as well for for Pastor Robert for you to just give him the words to speak and that he would just be a, a, a mighty tool in your hand, Lord. So, Father, as we come into this time, we ask that you bless it. And we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, this is a new song. We did this song on Wednesday. i 
Oh 
Jesus. Oh, how he loves. Father God, we thank you so much for your love, Lord, for the way that you just provide for us, Lord, the way that we're held in your hands, Father. Lord, we lift up this service once again to you and just ask that it would be a time of study, that we could get into your word and and study it, Lord, and and let it dwell within us richly. Father, I ask that uh, each and every person here would just be blessed for being here and and just be blessed to be a part of this uh, this time and this fellowship, Lord. So, Father, I just lift it all up to you, and I give it all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Welcome visitors. I know we have visitors from all over the, the West Coast mostly, right? Anybody else I missed? Sorry. Um, VBS starts uh, two weeks from now. I'm sorry, three weeks from now, June 20 through 24th, uh, 6 to 8.30 p.m., um, you have to be registered to attend, so we need to get everybody signed up. Uh, we've got invites and uh, posters in the back on the table there for folks to take out and about. Uh, there's a servants meeting next Sunday, uh, June 5th, after the service. Um, this Wednesday will be communion potluck, so make sure and attend if you can, and uh, bring a, a dish as usual, and, and we will have the Lord's Supper together. And 7 p.m. on Friday's uh, U-turn, right? Okay. Um, Additionally, we have an announcement here on a a men's retreat. And if anyone's interested, it's going to be in October 6th through 8th. That's uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There is a cost, $250. A little heavy, but we can kind of start saving for now. Uh, They'll take installments of $84 uh, by three installments. It's going to be in Marble Falls. It looks pretty... uh, It looks pretty engaging, so something to consider about. If you're interested in it, see me after uh, the meeting. We kind of want to get an idea of of if there's anyone interested. I know Tim is. Tim actually brought it to our attention. Thanks. Um, As well, uh, we don't take a we don't pass a plate at Calvary Chapel. We do uh, just request that you prayerfully support the ministry as Lord leads you. There's offering boxes in in the back, left and right. Pastor, thank you. Good morning. All right, uh, Ute, you are dismissed. All right. Uh, as we get, begin to look in our scripture today, we're going to be in Acts chapter 6. So um, before I even begin with prayer, I kind of just wanted to read the scripture to you as you're turning to Acts chapter 6, going to be looking at verses 8 through 15. And Stephen... Full of faith and power did great wonders and signs among the people. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Syrians or Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Pray with me, if you would. Father, we come to you right now, Lord, and we thank you as we begin this time looking at what we know is going to be the the first martyr of the Christian faith. Uh, Lord, not, not including our Savior, Jesus, but Father, we look at this not as uh, not as the beginning of something leading to death, Lord, but the beginning of someone recognizing their life for what it is. And we pray, Lord, as we look at this, that you would help us to, Father, grasp what is going on here. And and I just pray for each and every one of us that the Spirit be on us, and Lord, that you would enlighten those in here to, uh, Lord, as the message comes to a completion, that um, we would be able to pour into one another, to encourage one another, to stir up one another to good works and the things that we see here. And Father, I just thank you so much for each and every person here and lift them up to you. Lord, uh, bless each and every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I've entitled today's message, Debate, because it, it really is 
the result of this going into what Stephen is going to do with the trial and everything that he's going to go into begins with a debate or a dispute. Now, when you think of the word debate, what do you think of? Arguing, right? Maybe arguing with style, right? Civil argument. Eh, I don't know about that, but, you know, if you've watched any of the Republican or Democratic national debates, not so much, right? <laughs> those aren't debates, no. Those are talking points that everybody's trying to get. But, again, you know, when we think of debates, that's one of the things that we, you know, we kind of run to is those kind of things. Um, Benjamin Franklin loved to debate. Everybody knows who Benjamin Franklin is, right? Okay, well, Benjamin Franklin loved to debate, and occasionally even Benjamin Franklin would find himself overwhelmed by the arguments of his peers and, you know, his learned friends. And what he would say is, give me a day to think about this because I know I'm right. And do you remember what Benjamin Franklin invented? Electri no, he didn't invent electricity. He invented a printing press, okay? He invented his own printing press. So what he would do is he would go home and he would basically use Bible fonts, right? He would use Bible letters and he would print a page and he would call it the book of John or the book of First Peter. And he would basically print his argument into that piece of paper. And then he would insert it into his Bible and then he would meet the person the next day and say, you see, I have found it in the scriptures and you can't argue with the Bible. Right. Um, and, and it worked every single time. Now, this is not the right way to win a debate, is it? Okay, we know this isn't. But the funny thing is, is, is a lot of times when we begin to argue about Scripture, we'll do the same thing. We'll put our opinions or what I think about the Bible into it and then try to use the Bible to argue into, you know, you into thinking that what I'm saying is right. And the thing is, is because we're talking about the Scripture, a lot of times it can turn into even a violent argument. So let's look at it right now together in detail in, in Acts chapter 6, verses 8 through 15. Verse 8, Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. So we had seen in verse 5, right, where they had chosen Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so now it's saying that here he is, he's full of grace and power. Some of your versions may say full of faith and power. Um, they've even found Greek manuscripts that say full of grace, faith, and power. But the whole idea of it here is he's full of this because of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the things that we've seen over and over and over again. Um, but they also chose Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, uh, uh, Parmenius, Nicholas, uh, who was a Gentile convert to Judaism from Antioch. Now, and I told you that when we came together, I would find, you know, try to find a little more that wasn't strange or, or really out there about some of these guys. And really, there is nothing. Um, there's just uh, uh, some of the, you know, Roman Catholic, I think they call it martyrology or, or martyriology, which is where, you know, somebody in the 15th century kind of just made up stuff about a lot of the martyrs. Um, one of the things that we do have with early tradition, which is some of the like first through third century writers said about Procurus or Prochorus, which his name means worship leader or leader of the singing. OK, um, in that he became close to the Apostle John and actually was his emunonesis, uh, uh, which is his writer. He was the one that wrote for John. Um, in writing the fourth gospel, and later became the bishop of uh, Nicomedia in Bithynia, uh, and that ultimately was martyred in Antioch. And even that is tradition. Understand that that's not biblical, but I told you I would try to find out some more that, you know, I felt was somewhat supported by early biblical writings and stuff, and that's one of them. Um, so, but really, we come into Stephen. And we don't even know anything about him, no idea about his background, um, no idea about, you know, who he is, how old was he, was he 18, was he 20, was he, you know, because a lot of people would say, well, he knows so much about the scriptures that we're going to see in chapter 7, right? So people would say, well, he must have been older, but 
No, because these guys hit 13, you're a big boy now, get out, right? And a lot of these guys would get sent to a school or to training, you know, and he may have been in rabbinical training since he was 13. We don't know. Um, or he could have been old. He could have been a 50-year-old dude. We, don't, we just don't know. Um, I'm going for 50 because I'm 50. I think Josh turned 50 just near, didn't you? <laughs> a little bit less? Yeah, this is 46 or something like that. <laughs> so, you know, you got to make yourself feel better by making everybody older than they are, right? Uh, but one of the things that some of the early Christian writers used to say about Stephen is that he was part of the 70 that Christ sent out back in Luke chapter 10, right? In Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 17, I'm not going to read the whole section to you, but he, you know, he told these groups of 70 men, he sent them out by twos, and he said, go out, you know, um, uh, to these cities and uh, heal the sick, say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you because Christ's plan was to come in right behind him and say, you know, here I am. Uh, and then in verse 17 uh, uh, of Luke chapter 10, the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name, you know? And, and that's just crazy when you think about it, because when you think about one of the 70 that went out, one of them was Judas, the one that would betray Jesus. And then it makes you think that just because some of these guys did this, it doesn't necessarily mean that they were believers in Jesus Christ because they were walking in what he had set to do. And it reminds us of Matthew where people would come and say, Lord, have we not cast out demons in your name, done mighty works in your name? And he says at the end, uh, go away, I never knew you. So, you know, but here... We come into Stephen and, you know, with all these witnesses, with everything that's going on, they all had the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and Jesus was working through them. We know he's worked through donkeys, right? So he'll use us. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and, but the thing of us looking at this and coming to look at what's going on here with Stephen, and as he's doing this, he was being obedient to the Holy Spirit and to the calling that he was called in. Notice he, he is not, he, he's called to be a servant of tables. He's, he's just called to minister to the widows. But when you and I understand, when we step up to honor what God calls us into, when we step up as the servants that he calls us into, it doesn't mean that that's all there is, right? You just need to be willing to do the little thing. He always says over and over again, you do the little things and the, and the big things come. Right. And it should drive us, you know, it should drive us to find ways to commun communicate the beautiful truths that we have in him, because it's not it's not something we do in our flesh. I don't have to I don't have to win an argument with someone. I just have to share with them the loving, beautiful truth of Jesus Christ. A debate doesn't have to mean an argument. But it does mean that I need to stand up for what I know is right and make it known. Because I'm arguing with a dead person if it's an argument. But if I debate, if I come into communication with someone that's dead and show them life, I'm showing them something that they can have that I can't even give, but the Lord wants to give through me. And that's something that you have too. And here, Stephen is filled, and, and in being filled, our lives look different, you know? Because a lot of times we come into this and, and, I mean, it's tough. Because Stephen, here he is, he's full of faith and power. And a lot of us, we go, well, where's, where's mine? Right? I was sharing in prayer this morning in the, in the prayer session and saying, I've been praying that. Lord, where's mine? Fill me. Make, make me what you want me to be. Even if you've got to kill the things that are in the way inside of me. And it, and it ponder and pondering that and thinking about that and wanting that it made me think of Matthew ten thirty eight through thirty nine, that says, "He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it." And, and that's true in Matthew sixteen twenty four, Mark eight thirty four, and Luke nine twenty three. And you know we all know in Galatians two twenty where Paul says, "I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live." Right. And, and this idea of Stephen coming and being willing to go to a place where he knew he could end up dead, 
where most of us, me included, I oftentimes won't go to into a place where I might just be embarrassed by sharing the gospel, right? And Stephen, he comes into this and he does what he's called to do. And walking in the Holy Spirit, he goes to this synagogue, okay? He goes to this synagogue and he starts sharing with people. And we're going to talk about why, right? Um, And again, it's not about... It's not about you stirring up the faith to do these things. It's not about you, you know, because some of the teachers tell us, you know, you just got to have faith and you got to work that up and you got to do this. It's like, no, 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 no. My faith is in him. And I'm just going to go do it. Okay. I'm just going to walk in it. That's the whole idea that the Bible talks about to us in walking in him. It's, it, it's not something you work up in the flesh. It's something that you just do in him. Guys, it's in your regular life. Live for him. And, and, and that full that it talks about there, you know, as, I, as we talked about, some of your versions say faith, some say grace. The thing is, is that he is full of the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and as he is full of the Holy Spirit, he uses the scriptures to share truth. And it's irresistible, we see. Let's look at it. Um, Verse 9, there, then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, uh, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Um, you know, as we said last time, even folks of some of these ethnic groups were divided into further ethnic groups. Even, you know, even in the church, we saw Hebrews versus Hellenists and all that good stuff, right? Um, you know, if I were to say that what parts of these guys belong would belong to, what would you say? You would say Hellenists, right? Because the group of freedmen came out of Rome. They had been actually, their, you know, whether them themselves or them families had been captured when Rome came and took over Israel, and then they took these slaves to Rome. Okay, and then they were called freedmen because they either bought their freedom or earned their freedom or were given their freedom by their masters in Rome. And then because they had grown up and were speaking these languages, they came back. Um, And this is another thing as you're reading this, when it talks about this and it begins to name all these places, it's another one of those things that reminds us that this is history. Because one of the things that Luke is doing when he writes this, he's writing to someone about particular places and peoples. And he's pointing out to them, it's like that whole idea we've talked about where if I tell you, you know, it's, if it's over there by the North Walmart. Most of you who are from San Angelo would know exactly what I'm talking about, right? So when Luke writes and he's writing to the recipient of these letters and he's mentioning this, he's mentioning places that many have heard of. And what the locals refer to. So when he says he's arguing at this synagogue or disputing or debating, he says it in a way that communicates, you know. So it's like somebody from Jerusalem is saying, you know, he was arguing over at the synagogue of the Freemen. It's like, you know, at the First Baptist over on, 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 you know, this street or that street or on First Street. You know what I'm saying? Right. So this is another reminder that this is a historical event. This happened in history. And uh, the freedmen, the word is libertinos, and it literally comes from that. And they were ejected in, I think, 19 A.D. by Tiberius. So it's like for some of them, and they could have gone anywhere, but they chose to come to Jerusalem. Um, The Cyrenians were from North Africa. Um, The Alexandrians as well. Uh, Cilicia was Southeast Asia Minor, and, and it says Asia. And I actually had a map to kind of show you where it is, because most of us, when we think of Asia, we think of China. But it's not really that. It's mostly like Turkey and the Ephesus area. And um, it's kind of like like if you were looking at the Mediterranean Ocean, most of Asia would, like Asia Minor would be that, the North Shore. Okay? Um, so, but, it, you know, it's the south of it. Uh, so, and I know I'm not describing that well, but I'm, I don't do maps, right? Um, so, you know, I'm just telling you, it's not China. So don't, because I, I, I would always think Asia meant China, right? But it doesn't. Um, but one of the things that they are is they are Zionists. 
Everybody know what a Zionist is? It's someone that is incredibly nationalistic and proud and zealous for Israel. You know, a lot, most of us would say, well, that's great, right? I, I want people to be, you know, for Israel and about Israel. Um, but it has a negative connotation to it as well. Because for them, there is nothing but Israel. Okay? Um, this would, you know, somebody coming in and talking about the things that they're talking about would bend them out of shape. Because many of them, you know, some of them may have suffered because they were Jews. I mean, like we said, 19 AD, Tiberius literally kicked them out of Rome. Not because of anything except for the fact that they were Jews. So it's like if you've been persecuted over and over again simply because you're a Jew, and then somebody in your hometown, right, here we are in Jewtown, you know what I'm saying? And this guy comes in who says he's a Jew, but speaking Greek just like me, and he's telling me about this Jesus guy. And he's telling me this Jesus guy has fulfilled the law. He's telling me that all my traditions, everything I've suffered for, I don't need. That's their mentality. That's that active mentality. Um, it's the whole thing that reminds us when he says in Romans 9.33, Behold, you know, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling block, or stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. You have to understand, when he lays Jesus down before these guys, it is a stumbling block. It is a big deal to them. Because it is their very life and in their heads, their eternity. Verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Verse 11. Then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders, the scribes. And they came upon him, seized him and brought him to the council. What do we do when we can't, you know, win the argument, when we can't win the debate? We start screaming, we start yelling, and when we beat people up, right? We bring a bigger stick. It's, you know, and here, that's exactly what they do. Um, Luke 21, 15 says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. And they get to the point where they can't resist the wisdom and the spirit in which he is speaking, so they resort to violence. Um, they resort to physical action. And as we look at this, you know, just kind of understand, because a lot of people devote their lives to apologetics, and that's a good thing. And I do believe that apologetics is a good thing. But as we read this, we need to understand this is not just the brilliance or learning or, or intellectual like academia of Stephen that we're seeing in act here. Um, I do believe that he did study, that he did prepare, that he did do these things. Second Timothy 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as an approved worker who has nothing to be ashamed of, handling the word of truth with precision. We are approved in what we do here, and he is approved and shown to be approved because of Jesus. He is doing exactly what Jesus has called him to do. We work like everything depends on us, but we do it with the knowing that it is Jesus that will enable it and do it in us. It's one of those things where, you know, you see somebody and you know there's things to be done, you know, okay, th this trash needs to be emptied or that wall needs to be painted. Now, many of you guys as a worker, especially if you had a business or something like that, and you hired someone to work for you, and there's garbage, there's a wall that needs to be painted, there's a door that needs to be fixed, there's a window that needs to be mounted, you go, I see all these things, why don't you? You know, and the person says, I'm waiting for the powers to tell me what to do, Right? Whereas the power's already told you, especially in the word of God, go do this, go do this, go do this. You know, take the gospel out to everywhere, right? What does that mean? That means take the gospel out to everywhere. Hello. You know what I'm saying? God's already given many of us our marching orders. We just don't want to do it, right? And in that is where we find that peace. We've talked about this before. You know, because if I'm walking right behind dad, if I'm doing what dad wants me to do and I know I'm pleasing him, man, that that just lifts your heart. You know, you know, you're doing right. 
And as these guys come into it, here is Stephen, and he's just doing what Dad has called him to do. But the fact is, is he's doing it. Yeah. And like we said, when we can't win the argument, Hulk smash, right? And that's what these guys do. They all Hulk out. They they get triggered, all right? And, uh, you know, it's the same as today. If I can't win the argument, I'm just going to scream and yell, or I'm going to physically threaten you a- until I win. Um, you know, because I'm offended. That's just wrong. Uh, you, you know, I can't believe you would hurt my feelings this way kind of thing. Um, and it's it's just mind-blowing to me thinking about how it translates to modern. I mean, yes and no, it doesn't. Um, but speaking of how so many people are so easily offended today, including Christians, you know, I shouldn't be offended at what the world says about Christ. They don't know him. They're dead. You know? Um, I don't need to get bent out about that when I talk to the atheists at work and they say these things about Jesus. And all I do is go, okay, well, if you ever really want to know what it's about, let me know. It's not something I try to jam or win or, or get mad at because I remember what my mama taught me. Anybody know? Sticks and stones may... Hello, right? But here... This is, you know, and again, I, I don't want to really say that these guys should have practiced that, you know, that there's got to be some kind of Jewish teaching of that, right? You know, I'm not saying they should do that here because as these guys are sitting here and they're listening to this, when you get deeper and deeper into the truth of who Christ is, and, and we're going to see later on that even the apostles haven't really gotten it yet. The apostles are still learning and maturing in their faith. But these guys hear what they're teaching, and I think they understand it a lot better than we think they do. And you and I have to understand Jesus was Jewish. This is a Jewish faith, and these are Jewish people. And as they hear what he is teaching, they are beginning to understand that they're no, they themselves, still chosen still special by God, but are no longer exclusive. They understand this. And they also understand that Jesus has fulfilled the law. That is the one thing that they share and they teach that they understand, which is a huge deal. Because again, like we said, they have suffered for all these things. And if I literally am willing to die for my faith, and someone challenges my faith, then I'm probably willing to kill for it too. I'm not excusing what these guys are doing, but I want you to understand, if someone came into our church and began arguing against Christ in the middle of the sanctuary, most of us would escort him out in not so gentle a manner. You know what I'm saying? Right? Now, these guys, the synagogue is a bit different. Debate was often invited and often was encouraged. You know, and if somebody came in, I would literally tell them, hey, if you want to stay till after service, all of us would love to have a conversation with you. Right? You know, just don't disrupt what God's doing right now. But these guys, when it comes to this thing, and they're saying, okay, he's speaking against Moses. What is Moses associated with? The law. Right? The law, the Torah. So they're not just saying he's insulting Moses. He said Moses was fat, right? That's not what they're saying. They're saying he is literally speaking against everything that Moses did. He's speaking against everything that we live for. Notice they say Moses before God even, right? Because even the Lord says that he puts his word above himself, okay? That he'll honor that before everything. And when they and they can hear exactly what these guys are teaching, they're hearing what they're putting down, and they're like, "You're ah, no, no, no! I see where you're going here, and this is not cool, right?" Because their entire identity, and most of us know about identities, is wrapped up in being who they are. These guys are not just Jews, but they are like sold out, crazy, radical. You know, as we call ourselves sometimes, Jesus freaks, right? I am a freak for Jesus. And here these guys 
are, 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 their, their minds are blown by what he's saying and they can't contradict it and they can't win the argument. So then they go to the other guys. Do you hear what he's saying? And some of these other folks are probably just like, no, not really. I don't understand. And so they get everybody to go, here's exactly what he's saying. He's talking against Moses and God. You know, it's one of those things where if, if everybody else isn't getting it, I'm going to make sure you get it so you're just as mad as I am. Right? Yeah, yeah. If, I, if, if you're not mad, I'm going to get you there so we can all be mad together. Right? Misery loves company. Uh, and, and, again, he's not, this isn't the other apostles. He, he's just Stephen. He's not one of Jesus' main dudes, right? And these guys know this. He's nobody. He's a table servant. He feeds the widows. Right? So in their minds, he's nothing. And then they get the elders, the scribes. And who are the elders and the scribes? They're the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And what do they do? They do the Sanhedrin. They're part of the council. They're part of the law. And they've already been denied the blood of Peter and the other apostles, right? So what do they do? Just take them to court. The mob rules. So and now let's look at the charges in verses 13 through 15. Uh, they had false witnesses stand up and say, verse 13, this man never stopped saying things against this holy place and against the law. So if they are, you know, you, you and I think synagogue, we think they got their own building and everything. But remember when we talked about where were the Christians meeting at? They were meeting in the temple in Solomon's portico, right? And remember we talked about how many different groups would meet there. So all Stephen probably did was walk 100 feet. Right? It's not like he had to go to some building in town or anything like that. A synagogue, if you had 10 people, church, right? So that's all a synagogue is. And so he probably just walked over to where they were at and said, Hey, I understand. You guys are speaking in Greek. Well, let me tell you something, right? All right? So, you know, again, so when they say this holy place, they are referring to the temple, okay? And against the law, verse 14, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. So here the accusation that they bring to the Sanhedrin is a word the Sanhedrin doesn't even want to say. So really what's going on here, it's not Stephen that they're bringing to trial. It's Jesus. Okay? But Jesus is working through Stephen. So Stephen is brought before them. Okay? Um, and, and does it remind you of anything? Not just what happened with the apostles, but with what happened with Jesus, right? Matthew 26, 59 through 61. The high priest, the whole council, were looking for false testimony against Jesus in order to have him put to death. But they couldn't find any, even though many false witnesses had come forward. And at last, two men came forward and stated, this man said, I can destroy the sanctuary of God and rebuild it in three days. So when Jesus was crucified, that was one of the charges of blasphemy that was set out against him. He wants to destroy the temple. He was just prophesying. But they're not going to go with that. So when Jesus was crucified, what did they teach their people? Jesus said he was going to destroy the temple. So if this guy Stephen comes and he's doing it for Jesus, what did Jesus do? He wants to destroy the temple. What does Stephen want to do? He wants to destroy the temple. Plain and simple. Blasphemy. Let's kill this guy. Right? That's exactly where it's going. You know, because that's that's how our minds work. Over and over again, you know, and this is the thing, man, we see the followers of Jesus beginning, not just with Stephen, but with everyone. They're being brought forward and, and, and they're being hit and they're being, you know, challenged for their faith. Man, most of them are, are sharing Jesus with people. They're healing them. You know, guys that have been crippled their whole lives are walking. People who are blind can see. Those that had demons in them, they're, they're cast out. And, and it's just a reminder of what Jesus said in John 15, 18. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Because truth, man, truth is worth dying for. 
And sometimes because we love our lives so much and we, and we love the things of this world, uh, John 3 says that men love darkness rather than light. And we would kill for the things that we love. And they killed Jesus because they hated what he represented. And they'll kill us for what we represent. We have to understand that we're not immune from that. That sometimes we can do the right thing every time and it can go with what the world sees as going horribly, horribly wrong. But just like the disciples talk about Jesus like he's still there because they're working in his spirit, the world says, okay, you want, you want, you want to do Jesus? Well, let's put Jesus on trial. And here, you know, if you were dragged by a violent mob to this place, would you be scared? Yeah, I would be scared. I'd be terrified, you know. I'd be shaking in my robes, you know what I'm saying? I would. I would. My sandals would fall off because I'd be scared. My, my toes would be crunching up. I'd just, you know. I'd be abba dabba dabba dabba. I wouldn't know what to say, what to do. But here's the thing. When in verse 15, because what is Stephen full of? Grace and power, faith and power, faith, grace and power. That's what he's full of right now. And in verse 15, they all who sat in the council looking steadfastly at him, they are staring at this guy and they saw his face as the face of an angel. Wow. So they, they don't look at him and see somebody like me going, because I would literally, you know, veins, oh no, we're going to, I'm going to die. Right? But they don't look at him like that. And most of us, we think of angels as like fluffy little, you know, with the, and all that good stuff, right? But that's not the angel of the scriptures. The angels depicted in the Bible are warriors. You know, uh, they are beings of pure power that have been in the presence of God. Um, and, and it's they literally have seen the face of God. And it's evident in what they see. And it reminds us as you look at this, think about this now. He, he It reminds us of Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 through 30. And, and we've gone through this together, too, where Moses would literally wear a veil when he would be in the presence of God because his glory was literally making his face light up. All right. What did it look like? What did it look like? You know, in the transfiguration in Matthew 28, it said they glowed with white, the white that couldn't be described. You know, they, they could literally not describe it physically. And it was all because Jesus was showing some of his glory there. Because heaven and earth were kind of at those crossing points right there. When Moses would talk to God, he'd be in the presence of God. And just and, and we all know he couldn't see his glory and his, you know, in his face and live. So it was just a smidge, just a touch, just the backside of it, right? And when Jesus happened and these guys flip out, and we know later when they're getting ready to kill him in Acts chapter 7, Stephen's going to say, He's going to look up. And I'm wondering if he's already seeing this. And imagine if you were coming before these people and you knew these guys will kill me because I would have killed me before I got saved, right? And if you knew that, but then God opened up just a little thing right there. And you looked up and you saw. I mean, you saw it and you looked and you went, okay, you know, I know that's not a bad taco. That's Jesus, and he's sitting at the right hand of God. Right? If you saw that, and somebody drug you before it, and you saw it, man, you'd be like, oh, yeah, it's on, guys. It's on. I'm, I'm exactly where I need to be. And, they, and when you know when they were bringing him there, they weren't bringing him there in a nice manner, right? There was the beating, the punching, the throwing. But yet when they're staring at him, they're looking at this guy and they're going to accuse him, you know. <clears throat> and it's not it's not his own power. He's not just working up. He's not just, you know, I got skills. Let's go. It's not that. It's OK. I'm fixing to die. Oh, look where I'm going. 
Bring it on. Bring it on. Who reported this, do you think? Who told Luke what happened? Paul, that's right. Paul. Paul shared this with Luke. He had to because remember when we had showed you uh, the, the council room? There was literally a gallery for the students of the rabbis who were on the council. Who's on the council? No, he's a student of Gamaliel. Gamaliel is in the council, right? And in Acts 22.3, he says, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. You get that? I'm going to give away the story. Acts 7.58, they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of the young man named Saul. And we know that he would eventually be called Paul. And, and, you know, and that was a memory that would haunt him. It would haunt him until the moment that he uh, became a believer. And even after that, it would be one of the things that convicted him, not haunted him anymore. There was no longer, you know, that, that, oh, I'm so guilty I did this kind of thing. It's the idea of it drove him because he did many of the same things that Stephen did after this. He would go to the synagogues. Let's talk about Jesus, right? It's exactly what he would do. You know, and here we don't know if this this man is uneducated. We don't know uh, how much he knows, whether he's old, whether he's young. But we do know that Paul was probably here because Paul was from Cilicia. And this synagogue had Cilicians in it. And Paul was born a Roman citizen. Right. We're going to see that in the book of Acts, too. And no doubt spoke Greek, Latin, Hebrew, Aramaic. And here, there's this nobody. He's not a student of anybody. And I cannot beat this guy in an argument. He knows something's up. He knows something up. And he is going to hold everybody's coat while they are literally stoning this man to death in Acts 7.58. In closing, in, in Acts chapter 7, verse 1, the high priest looks at this guy and he's seeing the glory of God shining on his face. And he says, are these things so? Is it true? And Stephen is going to give literally the longest argument or the longest sermon that there is in the book of Acts. And we're gonna, it's so long, we're going to have to break it up into pieces when we get to it. And it goes from a debate, not just a debate now, but then an accusation bringing him to court. And just like what happened with Jesus, with Peter and, the, and then the apostles, is it goes from we're going to bring you into court and then Stephen is going to judge them. And it's awesome uh, because his sermon was, is full, not just of intellectual knowledge, but of faith and power. And you think, you know, what if he was young? What if, because he's been saved not even five years, okay? He has known Jesus Christ for five years. If he was one of the 70, maybe eight years. And he's going to die. Not an easy death, a horrible death. A death most of us would never long for, but yet... He looks at it with a face filled with glory. You know? And his life, it's full. It's full of the Holy Spirit. That's a full life. Most of us think a full life is, you know, the American dream. You know, house, 2.5 kids, you know, you know, one and a half dogs, 2.5 cats. Unless you're not a cat person, then you'd get another dog, right? But most of us have that thing of that. That's what life is. That's a full life. You know, most of us think a full life is me growing up my kids and getting them off to college and seeing them have kids. And that's a full life. But for Stephen, his life and every testimony that we know about him is not that he was a good husband, a father, a son, and anything. It was he was a man that was willing to die for his faith. It reminds us, you know, and here's the thing, Paul, this affected Paul greatly. Um, you know, it impacted him so because he saw this. He saw it, and he understood more than most of us would. 
He knows the scripture so well. You know, for the most part, most people believe that many of the students Gamaliel memorized the entire Old Testament, right? In Philippians chapter 3, he would literally say, you know what, guys? I'm like a super Jew. I'm the Jew of Jews. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a student of Gamaliel. I've done all this, you know. I have done everything. I was a Pharisee. But he says, you know, and he says, I was so zealous for the faith. I, I tried to kill the church physically. Blameless in the law, man, in the law, I was blameless. But he says, once I came to know who Christ was, I counted it all as rubbish for the sake of knowing him. He literally says, I counted it all as dung. You know, just to know him, right? That's how this moment impacted Paul. You know, and, and as we come into this, the thing is, is, you know, even if you're and I faith, when we encounter people, you know, if we witness in that loving way, in that way of truth, and we stand for the truth, and we walk in the Holy Spirit, you know, it, it's not about beating them up. It's not about winning the argument. It's about standing for what you believe. The truth of your fellowship with him is, do you walk with him even when it gets tough? You know, and, and it's not always that I know all this doctrine and can do all these Bible studies. But do I live it? Do I live it, man? You know, it's like James said, don't don't tell me you're a believer. Show me you're a believer. That's basically the, the crux of James, the book of James. Quit talking about it. Start doing it. Right. And you and I, again, man, for me, it's that's one of the things I, I'm like, OK, God, I want to grab onto him and say, kill the stuff in me that keeps me from being completely filled. You know. I just want to walk in him. I want to walk in him so much. I want my face to shine like that. I want people to look and go, no, nah, I'm not arguing with this guy. Right. I want him to know that I know him. To be filled with his Holy Spirit, full of faith. Wouldn't that be awesome if people said that about you? If people said, man, yeah, that guy, he's full of faith. He knows Jesus. I want that. One of the biggest enemies the church has is tradition. One of the biggest enemies the church has is the church itself. So as you and I get into this and look at, the, at what Stephen is doing and what's happening with Stephen, let's not get caught up in religion. Let's not got, get caught up in, in the necessarily the how we do things, but walking in his grace. You know, walking in the things that he's called us to do. You know, to not resist him. Being filled with his anointing. Walking in his power, not in my own. You know, the thing is, is I, I think for for me, and perhaps for others, and I don't know if this is it, but I think, you know, I want to get to that point and and I pray that you would, too, where you'd be willing to give up your life right now and not have to wait until somebody was going to take it from you. You know, the time could come. And, and here's the thing. It, it, if it doesn't come for us, it may come for our children. And don't you want your children to see what it means to give up your life? To give up your life for him? Because they need to learn that from us. They need to see that from us. If you would, stand with me and let's pray. Father, we come to you right now, Lord, and we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, that convicts, that extols, that reminds us, Lord, that, Father, you are the giver of all good things. Uh, Lord, that, and even as we come into this uh, with the, uh, the beginning of the sermon that Stephen is about to deliver uh, with power by the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that you would do the same in us. And Father, if there's anyone here, I, I pray right now, Lord, if there's anyone here that, that truly wants to be filled with your Holy Spirit, that you would do it. Lord, that you would move upon them and that you would work away in their life and that you would open up your word to them uh, and they would see in it uh, what it is you want them to do with their lives. Lord, because we know even if someone chooses just to, to clean the bathrooms at church, you might use them to save someone that could change a city, that could change a country, that could change anything. 
Father, I just I pray and I lift it up to you that you would guide, that you would move, and that you would do your work in us. I lift up every person here to you, Father. I thank you for their fellowship. I thank you for uh, the love. And I just pray that you would continue to move, continue to have your way. Give all these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, before we do the benediction, I just want to encourage you. Um, for some of us, I know one of the things that we do is we go home and have sandwiches after. Um, that doesn't mean you still can't hang out with somebody, you know. Grab somebody, grab another couple or, you know, or, or just somebody and say, hey, you want to come over and have sandwiches with us? Um, you know, or if you're going to go out to eat, grab somebody and say, you know, somebody you don't normally hang out with and say, you want to hang out? You want to do something? You know? Um, it's just one of those ways is that we can break down this idea because somebody mentioned it yesterday and this morning, and I, and I really do think that it's, it's, it's really prevalent, especially in our culture, the American culture, is, you know, just let me do my thing. Um, and, and we kind of, we come to church and then we bail and we don't hang out. And we don't do anything because, you know, okay, I've done that. And now I'm going to go do my thing. And, you know, it's one of the things that we saw in the early church in the book of Acts is they were always hanging out with each other, always eating everybody else's food, which will cost you a lot if Tim comes over. <laughs> that brother could eat, y'all, I'm telling you. It's, that's like a gift, man. It's awesome. <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, but I'm telling you, man, I, but see, if you don't hang out with him, you won't know that, you know, but if you hang out with him, you will find that out, right? <laughs> you know, but the same thing with Michael, you know, you, you hang out with Michael and you're going to find out a guy that will laugh at almost anything. And if you tickle him enough, you can literally stop him from breathing. Okay. You know? With John, deep guy, you know. With Chris, he likes his goatee a lot. So, with Tay Tay, I mean Taylor, sorry. But but again, it's all it's that whole thing. You know, some of you are artists, but if you don't hang out with anybody else, they're never going to know it. Some of you have great gifts to give to each other, but if you're not fellowshipping, if you do this and pff, go. You're not being the body of Christ. Being the body of Christ is not just coming to church. It's being the body of Christ. So be a part of one another. Fellowship with one another. Love each other. Yes, ma'am. Oh, in closing, one of the things that, uh, that I wanted to do actually at the beginning, um, but I didn't write it down in my notes, so I forgot, is... It is Memorial Day, but it's Memorial Day is not just picnic day. And we have a video to show you to talk about that. So here's what we'll do. Um, it's we'll watch the video. Should we watch the video and do the benediction or do the benediction and watch the video? Let's do the benediction and then y'all can watch the video and, and, and that'll be the close of service. So let's do the benediction. See, I had to ask mom. I had to ask I had to a ask my wife. I had to ask my brain. Okay. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Amen. Praise the Lord. Love to hear that from you guys. Um, okay, if you would, if you'd like to stay, you can watch the screens. <laughs>